a pleasant day STEM learners. This is Sir Peter, your pre-calculus teacher. For today's discussion, we will talk about week number four, hyperbola. Are you ready? On our first video lesson, the topic will be focused on the definition of the hyperbola. So at the end of the video lesson, you should be able to define and illustrate a hyperbola and its parts. Let's start. Recall the discovery of Apollonius Superga. If the cutting of the plane is parallel to two generators, that curve is a hyperbola. So observe figure 1.3, how the cutting of the plane intersects the double right circular cones. It forms a hyperbola. Now, how do we define a hyperbola in two dimension? So a hyperbola in two-dimensional conic is a smooth curve on a plane consisting of two separate branches that are images of the other. So as you could see, the red line are the what we call the branches of the graph. And it is the set of all coplanar points such that the difference of its distances from two fixed points is constant. Notice that the only word that is different from the definition of an ellipse is the word difference. Because for the definition of the ellipse, we use as the word sum. While for the definition of the hyperbola, it is associated with the difference of the distances from the two fixed points. And which are those two fixed points? Notice this focus and another focus on the two branches of the hyperbola, these are still what we call the foci of the hyperbola. So the foci are also what we know as the fixed point of the hyperbola, same with the ellipse. But this time, we refer to the um, constant difference of the any point on the hyperbola going to one of the foci and as well as this one. So later we will discover how are we subtracting those distances. Now here is the question. Is a parabola half of a hyperbola? Because it seems that on the graph of a hyperbola, there are two parabolas present. The answer is no. So a hyperbola is different from a parabola because a hyperbola is another set of conic. So the curved lines that you see on the graph are what we refer to as the branches of the hyperbola and they are not parabolas. I hope that is clear. So what are the two types of hyperbola? So the first one is called the horizontal hyperbola. That is if the principal axis is a horizontal line. So observe this principal axis. So horizontal parabolas have branches to the left and right. The second one is what we refer to as the vertical hyperbola. So the vertical hyperbola has a vertical principal axis. And these are um, curves with branches which opens upward and downward. So observe this one and this one. Next. Here are now the important parts of a hyperbola. So notice that a hyperbola, the same with an ellipse has two axes of symmetry, two vertices, two foci, and two latera recta. So this is how it looks like when it is a horizontal hyperbola, and this is how it looks like for a vertical hyperbola. Now let's talk about specifically this 
parts. The intersection of the two axes of symmetry is called the center of the hyperbola. Observe that point. In a vertical hyperbola, the center is here. Now, what are these two axes of symmetry? The hyperbola intersects the focal axis in two points called the vertices. So the focal axis is the basis of the type of parabola. So in this example, the focal axis is located on the X axis itself. Notice that the yellow points represents the vertices of the, um, the graph in which we name them as V sub 1 and V sub 2, respectively. So notice also that the vertices are the turning point of the branches. And this is how the vertices looks like on a vertical hyperbola. These vertices are the endpoints of a segment called the transverse axis. So this, is, this orange line is our transverse axis and the endpoints are V sub one and V sub two respectively. On a vertical hyperbola, this is how it's look. Um, the transverse axis looks like. It is also a vertical line. The axis that contains the foci, the center, and the two vertices of the hyperbola is referred to as the focal axis or the principal axis. Notice that the focal axis is longer than the transverse axis because the transverse axis is only a distance from V sub 1 to V sub 2. But the focal axis is a distance from focus to focus. And the focal axis is also what we know as the principal axis. Notice how it changes from a vertical hyperbola. The focal axis is a vertical line. And still, the focal axis is also the longer axis than the transverse axis. The third, the second um, type of axis is what we know as the conjugate axis. So the conjugate axis has no common point in the hyperbola, meaning it is not part of the graph, but it is perpendicular to the transverse axis at the center. So the conjugate axis has what we call um, endpoints. And we can name the endpoints as W sub 1 and W sub 2, respectively. So in a horizontal hyperbola, the conjugate axis is a vertical line. While on a vertical hyperbola, the conjugate axis is a horizontal line and still it passes through the center perpendicular to the conjugate axis. I mean the transverse axis. A segment passing through a focus of the hyperbola that is perpendicular to the focal axis is called the latus recto. Okay, so there are two um, lateral recta on the figure. So both are passing through F sub 1 and F sub 2 respectively. In the same way, in a vertical hyperbola, they are parallel along the focal axis. So observe the two lateral recta on the figure. An auxiliary rectangle that is not part of the hyperbola, but it plays an important role in graphing the hyperbola. Notice that the rectangle passes through the vertices and they also passes through the 
endpoints of the conjugate axis forming the rectangle. So the pair of opposite sides of the rectangle passes through the vertices. So the vertices are the common points of the rectangle with the hyperbola. The other um, pair passes through the endpoints of the conjugate axis. This is how it looks like in a vertical hyperbola. Now, why do we need to draw the auxiliary rectangle? Because connecting the vertices of the auxiliary rectangle will form the asymptotes. Notice that on this point, connecting to that point forms the asymptotes. And this point connected to this point also forms the asymptotes. Notice that the asymptotes are not part of the hyperbola, but they are closely related to the hyperbola because these asymptotes approaches, it gets closer and closer to the hyperbola, but they will never intersect each other. So sometimes in mathematics, we refer to these asymptotes as the saddest story about lines because even if you extend the hyperbola, they will never intersect with the asymptotes. And each of the asymptotes passes through the opposite vertices of the auxiliary rectangle. So that is how important the auxiliary rectangle is. And this is how the asymptotes look like on the vertical hyperbola. Notice also that the Asymptotes, the two intersecting asymptotes are formed by the opposite vertices of the auxiliary rectangle. Similar with the distances in an ellipse, we also have distances A, B, and C. Notice that 2A is the distance from V sub 1 to V sub 2. So that is 2A. This is 2A. So therefore, this is the length of the transverse axis. One of the axis of symmetry. Well, 2B, which is the other axis of symmetry, is the distance from W sub 1, W sub 2 this one. So this is your distance to B. So this is what we call the length of the conjugate axis. Conjugate axis. And the distance from F sub 1 to F sub 2 is our 2C distance. So therefore, the A distance is from center going to one of the vertices. Distance B is from the center going to one of the endpoints of the conjugate axis. And distance C is center to focus. Notice that A can also be named as the semi-transverse axis while B is the semi-conjugate axis because semi means half of these distances. And notice that the C distance is now the longest distance among the three. So we can say that C is greater than A or we can also say that T is greater than B in the same way of how we treat A, B, and C in a right triangle. Remember that? So this is how it looks like in a vertical hyperbola. So let's have a review again of the distances. The transverse axis is 2A. Therefore, this A here from vertex to center is the semi-transverse axis. The conjugate axis 
to be is represented here, this distance. But half of it is B. So therefore, this is what we refer to as the semi-conjugate axis. The distance from the center going to one of the foci is the C distance. So this is the C distance. But a focus to focus distance is the entire focal axis, which is represented by 2C. And observe, how do we compute for the C distance? It is just like the Pythagorean theorem. It's C is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. For the length of the lattice rectum, we follow the same formula, which is 2B squared over A. Same with the um, length of the lattice rectum of a of an ellipse. And for the eccentricity, the eccentricity is still c divided by a because this is the c value. But this time, since c is greater than a, the eccentricity of hyperbolas are greater than one. Okay, so. Not as that eccentricity changes as the conic also changes. Because if it is an ellipse, then the eccentricity is less than one. If it is a parabola, the eccentricity is exactly equal to one. If it is a hyperbola, the eccentricity is greater than one. And if it is a circle, the eccentricity is exactly equal to zero. So always remember that when we pertain to the eccentricity of a hyperbola, it is C divided by A, meaning the eccentricity that you're going to obtain is always greater than 1. So this, the eccentricity is also one way to describe the constant ratio of conics. So... This is how it looks like using Apollonius of Perga's discovery based from the cutting of the plane and the double right circular cone. Always remember that it will always intersect at two generators, both on the upper part and the lower part. And hyperbolas have what we call a branches and these branches are not parabola. The curves may be opening um, to the right or to the left, and the curves may also open upward or downward. Always remember also that hyperbolas has two intersecting asymptotes. For the next part of our discussion, we will be talking about the standard equation of a hyperbola center at 0, 0. So in your SIPAC, you could see some of these formulas useful. So you may have an advanced reading about this one on your self-instructional packets. Remember that hyperbolas are everywhere. So you could see some hyperbolas on an hourglass and power plants, how they are made and how they store energy. So the shape of these power plants are very important. And observe um, the water, how the waves forms the hyperbolic shape. These are the references used in this presentation. Did you learn something for today? On the next part of our discussion, we will now talk about the standard equation of a hyperbola center at zero, zero.